I think there's two camps when it comes to chiropractics, right? I can't find anybody who's kind of in the middle. If I say to at a party, oh, I go to the chiropractor, you'll hear one of two things. Oh my God, my chiropractor's amazing. I love my chiropractor. I couldn't live without him or her. And then the other side is, oh, they're all quacks. They're ridiculous. What are you gonna crack my back and make me feel better? Hello there, everybody, and welcome to another episode of the Orthopreneurs Podcast. You know, one of my goals for this podcast is not just to help you run a more profitable, low-stress practice, but to hopefully live a better life. And over the years, I've brought in people who are in the health and wellness space. I've brought in people in the mental health space. I just want to find experts in anything that I find interesting, and then maybe you'll find it interesting. So today, I've got somebody, first time ever, somebody in his category. Please put your hands together and give a warm Orthopreneurs welcome to Dr. David Bynum. Welcome, David. Thank you. Thank you, Glenn. Yeah, it's. it's I'm, I'm just so happy to have you here. Um, I know we've been talking about this for ages. You know, yes. we've sort of we've discussed this forever. Yeah, yeah. Um, and and in a second, I'm going to ask you to tell everybody your story. But I'm going to give you a quick little intro to everybody. David is a chiropractor, and he's not just a chiropractor. He's somebody who we've had a lot of conversations. We've talked a lot. He's got an entrepreneurial spirit, which is amazing. Uh, many chiropractors do, but you know, there's chiropractors out there who I've talked to who are very interesting, to say the least. And then there's chiropractors like David Bynum. He's he's as honest as the day is long. He will cite you literature from scientific journals and uh, and show you why things happen the way they do. And my goal for today with with David is to do some deep dives on some on some interesting things, not just chiropractics and how can you choose a chiropractor? What does chiropractic really do based on the science, based on the literature, based upon historical evidence? But we're going to jump into some really cool alternative medicine things that I'm kind of into uh, that I've been exploring with him and maybe one day we'll actually do. Uh, and, and we'll jump into things like trace elements. We'll jump into things like water. Uh, water? We're going to jump into water? No, we're not going to jump into water. Um, but let's start here, if you don't mind, David. Um, sure. Give everybody a little bit of an insight in terms of how did you end up where you are right now? Let's get okay. get a little background on you so we have a better frame of reference. Just a quick background on me. So um, I was born in California, and then my father was in the oil field, so we kind of moved around everywhere a lot in the Southwest. I was living in, I'm, I'm from Colorado originally, and I was living in Colorado at the time I had the big event, and that was I uh, broke my back in a snowboarding accident at Purgatory Mountain in southwestern Colorado. Uh, did the same thing that everybody does when that happens. You know, first you go to the ER and they give you the pain meds and uh, take the x-rays. That's where I found out that I actually, because at first I thought the injury was just in my knee. I'd ruptured my right ACL, complete rupture of the right ACL. Then when they x-rayed me, found out we broke my back as well. I was referred to an orthopedic surgeon who told me, um, you know, we need to do surgery. And at the time I was a broke ski bum and didn't really have the money, didn't have health insurance, didn't have any way to make that happen. So I went to the the, the cheaper alternative, which was chiropractic care. And uh, thank God, I don't even know if I told you this part, but the, the chiropractor that actually helped me was my brother-in-law. Oh, really? And so, yeah, yeah. So at any rate, he, um, I ended up going to him and about a year later, I was way better. And then, so that's when I, and through that whole process, that year journey, he was kind of educating me about what chiropractic is and the structure of my body and health and wellness and all these different things and just the philosophy of uh, wellness and really turned me on to it, really got me thinking about my health, got me thinking about my body, really had me appreciating it as well for the benefits that I was seeing from it. And then right, it was right after that, I knew I want to be a chiropractor, got enrolled, went to chiropractic college. That's how I wound up here in Dallas. That's how we met. And, uh, you know, married a Texan, ended up staying. And um, you marry a Texan, you're staying in Texas, brother. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's the way it works. <laughs> no going back. We're staying here. Yeah, so, you're stuck. Um, it was amazing, though. It, in uh, a lot, you know, they say uh, I had an accident. I like to say it was uh, it was not an accident. It was, you know, it helped kind of guide me into my path in life here, which I've always known. I've always worked with my hands my whole life. You know, I was in the trades before chiropractic. And then I've always liked serving people and helping people. And, right on. and then when a chiropractor served me and helped me, it helped kind of put it all together. So cool. that's where we're at. Yeah. I remember I once asked you, I was like, did you ever work with like bricklaying or? Yes, yes. Because I was a stonemason for many years. Yeah. If you see his hands, folks, you know, <laughs> as an orthodontist, as a, a dentist, we have strong hands. 
this guy looks like he could grab a, a <laughs> rock and crush it with his hands. Um, but don't worry, he's gentle on your back, I promise. Yes, yes. Um, and so you touched on something, and let's let's hit our first topic here. Okay. I think there's two camps when it comes to chiropractics, right? I, I can't find anybody who's kind of in the middle, right? right? People either say, you say the word chiropractics, and I'm not talking about professionals. I'm not talking about our relationship as dentists or orthodontists or healthcare professionals to chiropractors. Yes. We can talk about that after. I'm talking about as individuals. If I say to a, at a party, oh, I go to the chiropractor, you'll hear one of two things. Oh my God, my chiropractor is amazing. I love my chiropractor. I couldn't live without him or her. And then the other side is, oh, they're all quacks. They're ridiculous. What are you going to crack my back and make me feel better? Yes. And so if you don't mind taking a minute or two or three or whatever you want, can you explain in lay person's terms when we go to a chiropractor, what exactly is happening? Why, yes. you know, I know you, you you put me on a table, you put your hands on my back. It sounds like you just snapped every vertebra, vertebral column <laughs> in my back, yeah. you know, and, and I go up, I feel looser, I feel a little bit better, but, but what's really happening short term? What are mm -hmm. you doing, right? Yes. And what's the benefit long term? I think that there's many things happening, many layers of what's going on. A lot of it also depends on what exactly is going on with the person that's receiving the care. And, but in general terms, just generally speaking, it's dealing with the mechanics and the structure of the body and particularly the neuromusculoskeletal system. And what happens is like, if you study Guyton's uh, textbook of physiology, they study it in all medical schools. They study it. Probably, you probably studied it in dental school, we studied it in chiropractic college, PT study it, anybody in the medical field will study that book. And that book clearly states that structure will dictate the function. And so what we're trying to do is we're trying to bring a more symmetric aspect to the structure of the body, even though the body is asymmetrical by nature, but we're trying to bring more symmetry to the gait, to the spinal column. And then we know if we can do that, a lot of things uh, clear up. And so you know, and that's kind of like what the short term is. It gets very deep. And really at the, you know, when we get start moving into long term care and we start moving into wellness and management of certain conditions, what we're really doing at the end of the day, and especially if you just go research pain science, is we are trying to use the musculoskeletal system as leverage to affect the neurology. And so the neurology is how we sense pain. And it's really mind blowing when you think of pain and it's like occurring like down the leg. Say we have pain running down the leg, but the, the way we receive the sensation of pain is actually the information is traveling up the leg to the brain. So it's and all that pain is being perceived in the brain. It's not even actually happening in the leg. So pain is a crazy topic. It's a crazy science. You can really dive deep on it, but in just for a really basic, like lay level explanation, let's say pain, for instance, that's the number one reason why anybody comes to us for sure. And probably most healthcare professionals, I would imagine. So the part of your nervous system that senses pain is called the nociceptive system. And then the part of our ner nervous system that detects where we are in time and space and movement is your proprioceptive system. And these all come in the form of four different types of uh, neurology sensory that feed back in afferent fibers back to the brain. And, and they are fatter, uh, the cords for the axons, the way that the information travels to the nerve, they're bigger cords, they're type A, myelinated means they're wrapped in insulation. So that means the signal travels ultra fast with proprioception. Whereas like nociception, pain fibers, they're unmyelinated, so they have no insulation. Uh, they're type, they call them type C fibers, they're smaller fibers, and they travel much slower. And th those are the things that are picking up like all the different inflammatory things that we've heard of that create pain, such as like, right. uh, you know, C-reactive protein or all these, there's millions of lactic acid, all these different things our body's sensing that, uh, that these nerves are picking up. Well, what happens is, uh, you can literally create a, a gate dominant. So these, uh, nerves are communicating through ions at the spinal cord. This information travels to the spinal cord and up to the brain. You can literally create a dominance with the proprioception to where it can drown out that no nociceptive signal. The kind of like- In, in, uh, in, or in orthodontics and dentistry, we used to refer to that as the gate control theory of pain. Yes. Uh, right, where a fat guy and a skinny guy are going through the door. If the fat guy goes into the door, he yep. blocks it and you can, and that's why acupressure, uh, you know, touching something when you're putting yes. a needle into a patient when you're getting them numb, uh, it's not just distraction. You're actually blocking 
the the nociceptor, right? And you're allowing without, the proprioception to come through, right? Without a doubt. That's why when you bump yourself, you rub it. You hit your thumb right. with the hammer and you shake it off because that movement is literally draw, uh, doling it out as Mozak and Walls, Halls, I believe. Can't remember, but there was two guys that created the gate theory. So that was actually, and what they were doing when they figured this out is they were, uh, it, I, I believe it, I can't remember what war it was. I want to say like World War II or something. And they literally were able to do surgery on people through electrically stimulating the spinal cord without any anesthesia because they ran out wow. of anesthetic medicine. This is how it was all kind of discovered. Then they started researching and it turns out it's a real, I mean, it's still a theory, but it's very repeatable and there's a lot of literature and information to back it all up. The gating. So, ha- so how does chiropractic care, I get the idea of, of uh, touch and pain, yes. right? But how does chiropractic care um, help somebody? Is it generally a pinched nerve or a nerve that's being pressed upon? So you're realigning the spine, you're putting the disc in the vertebral columns yes. in the right spot. Is that yeah. how it's really working? Yeah, it's like, and I love the word pinch nerve. All through chiropractic school, we were taught, don't ever say pinch nerve. And then as soon as I get into practice, I get all these referrals from MDs and they put pinch nerve. I'm like, wait a minute. <laughs> but, mm-hmm. but what happens is the it's the inflammation, they say, that pinches the nerve. But I know, I've seen it on MRIs that discs can pinch nerves. I've seen on MRIs that ligaments can pinch nerves. I've seen on MRIs that muscles, uh, tendons, all sorts of things can pinch a nerve, but even bone itself can pinch a nerve. But most commonly when you feel the pain and it's the sharp crick in your neck, a lot of times that's uh, probably inflammatory of some sort, but that could be a disc injury. Like if you have an annular tear, a tear on the outside of the disc, that can create lots of pain, you know, and, and a lot of inflammation will start coming to that area to try to heal it, break it down, heal it up. And that's a lot of what you'll feel right there is pain. And, and a lot of just, times... A lot of times what someone thinks is pain in their spinal column is actually a muscle compensating for the injury, right? So your muscles actually in spasm, Yes. you don't realize it, it manifests itself as back pain. Yes. And by doing chiropractic care and realigning things, you get the muscle to shut down a bit, correct? Yes. Uh, it, it, It kind of like that, yeah. A little bit. It's kind of like weird. that means I was way off. <laughs> no, no, actually, it's pretty close, but it it gets very deep too. And I and I honestly think that most chiropractors don't even understand the science, but they just know, oh, I get the results, and so they know that if I do this, the pain goes away. But what it really boils down to um, an alignment of the upper neck, and just how, not not even the upper neck, just the skull on spine relationship, and so. Mm-hmm. And, and what, because it's like, why did my right knee wear out and not my left knee? Why does the right side of my back hurt? If, if it's non uh, trauma related, let's say, right. you know, why does this hurt over here? Why doesn't it, shouldn't it hurt both sides? Right. Like if we're using them both equally and what happens is it's, uh, you have this thing called your writing reflex and, and even taking it back before that, your vestibular system, it's the first of all your senses to really develop your sense of where you're at, you know? And so in, with the vestibular system will always try. It works with the eyes. It works with all input coming into the body through like your afferents, like we were talking about those proprioceptions and everything else. And, and then, and so, and it's always trying to keep your eyes and your occlusal plane, plane, what you guys would probably call it lined up with the horizon. And, and that's not just a sense of looking out the horizon. It's a sense of it's 360 degree range. So that anytime we come off of our center through our vestibular system, it can come right back. And through our inner ear, through our eyes, it's crazy. The Postural Restoration Institute says 80% of all input into the brain comes from the eyes. Well, what happens is the nervous system does function throughout the body asymmetrically. You know, that's how we can ambulate. That's how we can just do all the things we do. And uh, it can happen in birth. It can happen in trauma, like a whiplash injury or falling off a horse, something like that. Or it can just happen, you know, like postural distortion is kind of like what we're talking about here. So whenever you get a pain, some random person says, why do I keep getting a crick in my neck? Say they get, keep getting a crick on the right side of their neck. And one, two, one, two, three times a year, they throw it out and it never, they can't ever fix it. They can't ever figure it out. Well, this is what happens whenever you get misaligned in the upper cervical. It's just like we're talking about proprioception, just like the brain talks to the body, body talks to the brain. And the brain, the body is literally telling the brain after a while, this is where we're at. And so the job of the eyes is to take the information in and then it can create the muscles to react to the environment how it should. 
So if you have a slight tone, for instance, in your the front of your neck and your SEM, and this could happen from birth, this can happen. Most babies, will, you'll see more slight tone on this side just because the right side of the brain, it develops right to left, right? Well, what happens is if as you have more tone on the right side of your brain, this can happen from an imbalance of the brain even. This can happen from stress, stress in the environment. All kinds of things can create that tone to, to offset and say it happens more on the right side, most people are going to, uh, what they'll call it a right torsion. Keurig Institute calls it like a right, right ocular tilt. Um, me and in my techniques and what I practice, I just call it a head tilt, you know? But basically, it, but it's more than that. And what happens is as that gets off plane, because the vestibular system will always drive the eyes to the horizon so that we can orient ourselves in time and space and get lined up in that plumb line of perfect posture, what, what happens is, the the otoliths in the ear and the information in the eyes because if you're laying sideways you can't get a clear vision so you got to straighten your head up so that that double vision goes away so that the eyes can both superimpose the image they're seeing in the brain on top of each other perfectly and and it, 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 as this head tilt is going this way my eyes will get driven to the horizon through the vestibular line or through the vestibular sense and so as it does that it's going to have to tension and tone things and you can't see but like for instance, the average person that has a head tilt to the right, they're going to have issues in their left hip problem. That a lot of times they'll get left because as I tilt my head to the right, my shoulders now got to drive the eyes to the horizon. And if you look at my, you can't really see, but my right hip is dropping back so that I can load everything on the other side. And then they develop those problems. Interesting. So it, it all starts with the eyes because when we take photos of patients and we want them to look like natural posture, we have them look in the mirror, right? right. So they look at themselves and then they level out, like you said. Yes. Um, but for those who aren't watching, who are just listening, basically he tilted his head to the right. And then in order, in order to get level, if his neck is contracted on one side, his whole body has to shift now to get the eyes right. Now the right hip is sticking back and out. Right. And now you have a gait issue. And so it, I guess it, going it messes with everything because, um, like, and like you were saying, it all comes from the eyes, right? So mm -hmm. as that head levels out, the way it has to level that out is it, so you have your, in posture, for instance, you have two different types of muscles. You have your tonic muscles and your phasic muscles. Are you familiar with these at all? In posture, you have your tonic muscles and your phasic muscles. And your tonic muscles, those are your uh, postural muscles. That's what can keep my ear hole over my AC, over my lesser or over my greater trochanter or my hip, and then right over the knee, right over the ankle. And now I'm effortlessly slicing through gravity like a knife, right? Your tonic muscles are firing constantly all day because if you can imagine just keeping your posture upright, it's it's a constant thing. Your phasic muscles are more of like the movers. Those are what if I think, hey, I want to grab my bottle of water, take a drink. It's my phasic muscles using my biceps, using everything that it uses. Your, your, your phasic muscles are typically it's the, what they'll call it neurology is like an upper motor neuron because it's coming from the cortex goes down to the alpha motor neuron or the spinal cord. And then that is, that's your, now your lower motor neuron. And that's what tells the muscles what to do. So you're, you're, you have two parts of your nervous system, autonomics and your, so you have your volitional, but your autonomic and your volitional is just like, I can move, I can think about it. I can pick up my cup of coffee. Whereas your, um, non-volitional or your autonomics, that's just happening without you knowing it. Like my heart just beats, my lungs just right. breathe, my food just digests. All the, that is broken up into two different realms. That's in your, I know you're familiar with this, your sympathetics and your parasympathetics. So your, your sympathetics are your fight or flight. So like, if I go to you, like I'm going to punch you, it's going to be all of your flexor muscles that guard you. If I, if you put your hand on a hot oven, it's your flexor muscles that pull it away. If you, if I go swing a baseball bat at you, it's my flexor muscles that I'm using to swing it. And it's your flexor muscles that are going to curl you up in a ball on the ground to protect all your organs and your vitals and your head. So your, your flexors are, are sympathetic. They're reacting to the environment so that you know how, how to move in. And so when someone's sympathetic, what happens is they have more tone in their flexor muscles. And so you, you, you see the fighting posture. They're hunched. You can see people that have like a view of the world that the world is dangerous because they have that fighting posture that they're just walking around and people that are more confident, 
people that are uh, they're they move with more ease in the world. They're more upright. They have more tonic control over their muscles. That they have, as opposed to phasic. And so what happens is you get the head tilt, right? That's a phasic muscle. My SCM is what they would call the most rostral flexor coming off my body and is ran by my brainstem. And our brainstem is like our lower levels. That's where all your autonomics are. That's what they call the reptilian brain. It's like the remnants of the reptile in us, right? Okay. It's the animal. And then as you get out further, you have the cortex. That's like our more angelic, or that would be our more higher advanced um, cognitive capabilities. The job of the frontal cortex, one of the main jobs, is to dampen all that animal, to dampen the amygdala, dampen the temporal lobes, dampen the sympathetics, thereby dampening your flexor system and increasing tone to your tonic system so that you can have better posture. And, and it, it, you can get into developmental biology, neurology, and read more about that. But where that affects us is if, say, I have a decrease in my right hemisphere of my brain which is what most people have. That's what they see in ADHD. That's what they see in all these uh, different type of um, learning, especially type of abilities is a decrease in the right frontal cortex. So if my right frontal cortex decreases, all of my brainstem stuff, which is the same side, like my SCM is going to increase in tone. And there's a great book called Muscles Alive. I highly recommend you guys to read it. This guy went through with 32 EMG channel hookups, hooked it up to everybody's body and just studied all kinds of stuff about posture, movement, pathophysiology of pain, very interesting stuff. But at any rate, um, in this book, he, he talks a lot about this. So if I increase the tone right there, we know that all my movers are cross. So like my right, you know, they say the right brain controls the left side. That's only true for my major movers. All the postural tonic stuff, it goes down the same side. So that's 90% of your brain power is going down the same side. Interesting. But that's just to stabilize me so that if I raise my right arm, I don't fall over. So I know right. the teacher says, raise your, arm, your left arm. I raise my left arm. All my extensors and stabilizers are firing off on the other side to keep me from falling over, to keep us balanced. That's how we can walk. That's how we can do all these different things. So if I have this head tilt, what my body has to do to get me level to the horizon is it has to engage my flexors. It has to engage my other psoas. It has to engage my other pec minor. It has to engage all these different things. And then so what you'll typically see with the right head tilt is you'll see the left rolled in shoulder. You'll see the left foot flare because now the the hypertonic psoas when you get this skull on spine misalignment off it sets you up for every nerve entrapment in the book all the way from thoracic outlet syndrome to upper t4 syndrome to pronator terry syndrome to carpal tunnel syndrome to snapping hip syndrome to creating shear on your acl pcl mcl to uh even affecting bunions in your feet and one of the things i like to tell people because if this sem is going off, it's my head's going to come forward, right? If right. the average head weighs 10 pounds, I always tell people just stand up straight and try to lean forward as much as you can and just feel the amount of tension on the bottom of your feet. Now, granted, it's not going to be forward like six inches like I'm doing it, but if you have a half inch forward head tilt, and if the average head weighs 10 pounds, you could potentially be adding 50 pounds of traction to the whole spine. Imagine what that's doing on my plantar fascia. You don't think that's going to make a bone spur after 20 years of walking around like that start to appear on my calcaneus? And, you know? and by the way, I love your explanations, but you and I could do this. We go down this rabbit hole and lose every person on this podcast if we haven't <laughs> I lost know, it. I know. And so I'm, I'm stopping you there because we could carry this conversation on for days. Yeah. And there's so many cool things I want to talk about with you. And so um, thank you for that. Yes. The question, the question I have for you is let's start with – I don't know. Let's start with water. Okay. Simple, basic, mm -hmm. not too long, quick and easy. But yes. I saw you drinking water, right? Yes. And you picked up your bottle of water that you have. You want to pick it up. You can if someone wants to see it. Yep. And, I, and you're yep. like, man, this is really good water. I'm like, well, what makes a water really good? So yes. in the in the layperson's terms, really easily, explain what you explained to me before we went on this call. Yes. So, you know, water, they say we're 70 to 90% water, depending on what organ, what part of your body you're talking about. We're mostly water. Water, they're starting to find out, carries all kinds of information in it. Have you ever heard of this book called The Emotions of Water? Uh, the, the Emotions no. of Water, this Japanese guy, Emoto, his last name was Emoto. I can't remember his first name. He was a scientist, research scientist, wrote a book. Uh, and he basically would take water. This, we're getting kind of into the woo here, but it was repeatable. He did the study over and over again. Different people did the study. So this is, uh, you know, it sounds woo, but there was a bit of science behind it. At any rate, what he would do is he would take water and he would take it and he would hold it next to him. And then he would give it love or hate. 
He would give it negative emotions, like he would say jealousy, and he would focus on jealous energy, and he would try to program this water with jealousy. Then he would take another thing of water, and he would try to program it with joy. And then, and he did this, and he did, and many people have repeated this study, by the way. I actually have a friend who did it, because there's a way you can freeze water. They actually now understand there's four phases of water, and there's a phase right before it freezes that it's in. It's like a liquid crystalline structure. And there's a machine now that they make so that you can perform this study yourself. And um, what happens is the the molecules that what we would call like the more positive emotions or whatever, love, joy, happiness, all these things had perfect structure, geometrical patterns that looked beautiful, pleasing to the eye. Then when you would take the other molecules that are the other emotions, the more net, what we would call the more negative molecules, distorted patterns chaotic looking, not as pleasing to the eye. You know, the water carries tons of information. And so because of that, I believe that the best kind of water to drink is spring water. Uh, Better than that even is artesian well water. But uh, spring water is literally, when you drink water for coming from a spring, it literally took that molecule of water, it touches your lips. It took probably 10,000 years for it to recycle through the hydrologic cycle, go down in the aquifer and work its way up through the limestone, the sandstone all these different things that it's suspending the colloids in the perfect mixture that the earth is doing for you. And by the time it reaches the surface, it has perfect amount of all the electrolytes you can need over 99, 102 of the trace minerals that your body needs in the perfect way that your body can absorb it. And it, like literally they've literally ran them, ran this water through different things and the water can, the, the carbon molecules, they can, um, or the hydrogen can spin left or spin right. And they say that it spins left, which means it's more absorbable to your body. That it's just crazy how far they break it down. But what they do with like, you know, your typical, uh, say you buy Dasani, right? You go buy Dasani. What they do with that water is they distill it, which means they remove everything natural from it. So now essentially the water is dead and they put baking soda back in it. And that's what they, you know, Sodium bicarbonate is what you'll read on the thing, but they put uh, fluorides in it. They put all kinds of different chemicals in it, most of which your body can't even absorb or it can create some kind of an issue anyways. I mean, you know, I knew a guy uh, just last week. I was talking to this guy and he said, I heard that if you alkalize your body, you can do it with uh, baking soda. Right. So he took like a teaspoon of baking soda, started doing this every day. Next thing you know, he thought he was having a heart attack, had to go to the cardiologist and they told him. Was it? And it turned out his system, he made it too alkaline. His heart was going up. He pushed all his potassium out of his body. That's because it's an unnatural way to do it. And it's very potent when you do it that way. But if you take spring water that the earth is programmed, that has all the minerals that your body can 100% absorb in it, it's it's just a no brainer. You can taste it. You can taste the difference in, a, in spring water compared to like uh, reverse osmosis water. And and that was the question I was really getting to, right, which you answered very well, which was there are things in spring water, there's things in artesian well water that aren't there. And and again, really quickly, because there's so many other things I want to cover with you. um, You talked about when I asked you about your water, you picked it up and you read on the water bottle something about solids. What were you looking at? So I'm looking for uh, total dissolved solids. You want that number to be lower, like around 200, 300 parts per million because your body, because if you have high dissolved solids, what's going to happen is your body, a lot of that stuff's going to gunk your body up and it could calcify into your tissues. And as opposed to into the body, into the bone, into the organs where you need it. And so it just means that it's more bioavailable to your body. Got it. Uh, And just one last note on the the spring water too, is it doesn't have all the chemicals that like you can't filter out, for instance, atrazine. Like if I just, you could go to EWG, it's this website that or ewg yes that it's this website that you can type in your zip code and it will tell you what's in your drinking water all these municipalities have to report it i googled mine i'm in north dallas we have plain of water my we had atrazine in our water which is an herbicide but atrazine for instance they take frogs they put male frogs in atrazine and the male frogs turn into females and they can actually have babies even after that they can actually conceive after this, but uh, they had chloroform in our drinking water. They had uh, birth control in our drinking water. I mean, these are things that if your human kidney can't filter out, what what do you think? How do you think the uh, waste system, you know, the uh, water system is going to be able to treat that, you know, not to mention they're treating it with chemicals that, yes, it does kill the bacteria and we need that. But, you know, your body's absorbing this when you're taking a bath. Your body's 
absorbing it when you're brushing your teeth, your body's absorbing it when you're cooking your food in it. And all that does add up to stress on the body long-term overall, you know? That's amazing. Now, I want to hit two more things with you because okay. um, they're going to blow people's minds. The first is Cambo. Yes. And the second is Ayahuasca. Okay. Right? And so yeah. let's tackle Cambo first because the yeah. first time I heard anything about Cambo, and this is really good for anybody out there with immune issues, for people with skin issues. Um, there was a story that you told me about someone who I later met, former yes. NFL player, yes. um, who later himself became a Cambo uh, provider, if you will. Yep. But if you want to explain to people what is Camo, and people, when you hear this, please do not turn off the podcast because yes, you're going to yes. think it's bananas. You're going to think it's crazy. Um, but I've met people who've been through this. I don't need it necessarily. So I'm not jumping on that one mm -hmm. right away. Yeah. Uh, but if you can explain what is Cambo, where does it come from? What does it do? Uh, because we're getting shorter on time and I, I don't want to go too deep on it, but um, explain what it is and then how it helps people. And then yes. we'll, we'll talk a little bit about it. What the practitioners that use it, they can they call it an animal medicine but what it is is it comes from the phyla medusis i think is what it's called but the or the street name for this is like the waxy toad brazilian tree frog it comes from a poisonous frog. tree frog from it south comes america from a tree frog it's the a big frog that makes a big i mean the croak on this thing sounds crazy it's crazier than any like uh bullfrog you've heard or anything like that it has a very distinct and they and they climb in the trees in the jungle and to watch these guys harvest it down in the jungle the big people that really use this medicine and that have kind of uh, that bring it to us are the Matisse tribe down in Brazil. And um, they're like in Peru, place, in the Amazon. And so this this frog comes from the Amazon and it, it, re it releases these secretions. So the people that harvest this medicine, there's no harm done to the frog at all. It's all done very respectfully. And it's basically the secretion on the frog. And I, and I believe that that secretion protects that frog from its predators, but they scrape the secretion off. And then they uh, will literally, the way that the medicine, the way they apply it, they apply it to you is they blister your skin. It almost looks like a little incense stick that they burn like a little dot in your arm. And when I say burn, they're not even going through the third, they're not even going down to, they're barely on the surface level of your skin. Because the way this medicine accesses it is that it goes into your lymphatic system. And this actually, the first time I ever tried Cambo, it changed my mind completely on how the lymphatic system works. Because I always considered the lymphatic system kind of like the sewage of the system of the body. And you got to get this lymphatic drainage and it just moves slow. And it actually, the information in the lymphatic system travels at the speed of light. And here's why I say this. Because the first time I ever tried Cambo, the second the practitioner put the dot on my arm, I felt it in my feet. Like that, amazing. it is amazing. And there's over a hundred polypeptides in it of which eight have been heavily extensively researched. I think dynorphin was the one that, uh, had been researched. Um, but none my question for you is yes, well, again, because I know we're going to, you and me, we get, dive into the science right away. And for yeah. most people out there, they just want to know what does it do and who is it indicated for? Who yes. will it help and how? Absolutely. Okay. So it's kind of become different since it's made its way up here to America. In South America, what they use it for is they use it for depression. They use it for like kind of mental disorders like that, mood disorders. And then they use it for a streak of bad luck. But, and that's kind of, and I don't know how it made its way up here. It's been around for a while. But essentially what people are using it for now is it's because it's a lymphatic cleanse. It's a cleanse. It's, it's a purgative medicine. So it will make you puke. They put you on a special diet before you do it. And, um, and you have to be fasted when you come into it. And so... And, and it's and, you, and when you puke, it smells like bile and it looks like bile. So it's literally pulling toxins out of the body and putting it in uh, from the liver. It squeezes. You can feel your liver. You can feel your uh, pancreas. You can feel everything almost flexing and squeezing it all through that bile duct into your gut. And right about that time that it occurs, the practitioner makes you chug the water and you purge all that stuff up. I've seen people. I had one guy said he purged a quarter that he swallowed when he. Yeah, you're talking about a quarter that yes. had been in his stomach like for. 40 years yes yes and so and it was like had uh it had like a, it was oxidized and then had some like kind of calcification on it and it was crazy but so it cleanses the body um also because the, pe the all the peptides in it and you guys see all the peptides help with anywhere from mood to body healing to hormonal regulation i mean polypeptides are used in everything in your body so there's but, many but positive question, benefits but my question for you is if someone has psoriasis, someone has skin issues, someone has yes. 
You know, you and I know somebody who played in the NFL yes. who had his body had been abused by so many medications, so many cortisone, so much stuff to get him ready to play that his skin was just destroyed. Absolutely. And he ended up using Cambo and it, and it helped him tremendously, right? Tremend it actually saved his life. So Solomon Page is who you're talking about. And he, the first time I saw that guy, he was wearing a hospital gown because his body was he had eczema that was uncontrollable to where it turned into staph infection and spread through his whole body. And then he went septic and he became so bad and so hard for the medical doctors to manage that they basically sent this guy home to die. And as, and as a last result, uh, this nurse practitioner here in town that we both work with, um, her and I are into the Cambo. She told him, Hey, you should try this as like a last ditch effort. Cause she's thinking maybe this will turn your immune system off. Cause he was having all these crazy autoimmune uh, responses that we later on, you know, we think we tied it to all the, like, I mean, tons of cortisone injections, but, um, but basically what happened is the moment he took it, he said instantly, like, obviously when your skin scabbed up, that takes time to heal. But he said instantly his skin just calmed down. Like he felt it calming down, you know? And uh, what I believe it does is I think that it just, there's not much research behind this aspect of it, but I think what it does is um, it in chiropractic, there's an adjustment you can do, which will activate the sympathetics and it's adjusting the front side of the spine. It's very hard to do, but when you do it, people go through a sympathetic storm, like their palms get sweaty, their pupils get blown out. They start respirating really heavy and it only happens for a short while, but then they go into a heavy sympathetic mode. And what I think that the Cambo does is your immune system so spiked up that it just fully spikes it up and wears it out. Almost kind of like the difference between cancer and a long-term infection. You know what I mean? Where right. your uh, white blood cells are so spiked, eventually they just get tired and they stop spiking. They can't keep up anymore with it. I think what it does is it just ramps your uh, immune system up even a little bit more to where it just kaputs and gives up. And then now you get this little break, you know? Yeah. So my question is, if someone was looking for somebody in their region to do mm -hmm. Cambo, yeah. is it something you just look online? How would you find somebody who can help you? So I think that the best practitioners come from this school. There's the international, uh, the IKAP, International Cambo Association. I don't, I, I don't, I don't like them as much because I feel like they get a little more woo than uh, there's this group called, out of Colorado called Tribal Detox. And uh, they're a school for Cambo practitioners. And this guy, uh, goes down to the jungle all the time. He sources the medicine directly from the people. So he knows the people where you're getting it. He knows the frogs where you're getting it. He personally trains all of his own Cambo practitioners. And this guy was like an underwater swimmer for the Coast Guard for six years. So he's big on health and safety. So he like part of the schools, like getting CPR certified. And I mean, they're just really big into the safety aspect and the science aspect of it. Because, you know, as you know, with these jungle medicines, a lot right. of the blue comes in. And so he keeps it really... Uh, pragmatic. And he, you can go to his website. I think it's called Tribal Detox, I believe. If you just Google that, it'll pop up. And then he has all his practitioners that are all over, definitely America. And I think he's starting to kind of get into the world now too, uh, oh. out there. But I know cool. like almost every state should have a practitioner there. I, I, The last thing I want to bring up here, and again, we could do this all day long, Yes, yes. is <laughs> ayahuasca. Yes. Now, I know you recently, I was in your office. You're like, hey, dude, I'm running down to Peru. Uh, yeah. I, it's very rare, but I'm going to get a chance to hang out with the medicine man from one of these tribes in the jungles of Peru. And, you know, and then you came back. You're like, oh, my God, ayahuasca was like, it changed my life. And again, because yeah. we're getting shorter on time. Okay. If you want to talk a little bit about what it is, mm -hmm. how you prepare to do it, and and what happens when you've done it and why a lot of people I've heard, and it's not just fringe, I've heard a lot of people, including orthodontists I know, talk about the fact that the ayahuasca changed their view on life. Yes. Like, and I've heard people talk about ketamine mm -hmm. having a very similar kind of response, yes. but not with as many side effects potentially uh, and not being as out there as mm -hmm. ayahuasca. But I'd love, to, uh, I'd love to hear your take on it. Yes. So ayahuasca has been around for thousands of years. It, it, you know, when you talk to the people down in the jungle, they say it, like that, the guy that I go down to that I'm actually getting ready to go sit with here in like three weeks, I'm heading back down there. Uh, Enrique, he says his people have been there for 5,000 years serving up the medicine. If you wow. study what the anthropologists are saying now, supposedly we weren't even down there yet. But if you go sit with these guys, you'll probably believe them more than the anthropologists. You know what I mean? <laughs> like right. just what you experience, you know? 
And it's, it's very hard to talk about because I don't think there is a clear answer on what is it and what's it doing. I think it's very individualized to each person. What it is, is um, the, the active ingredient in ayahuasca is DMT. It's called dimethyltryptamine, which uh, your body just naturally produces it anyways. When you have dreams at night and when you are, um, and when, actually when you're born and when you die, your brain releases, your pineal gland releases massive amounts of DMT. And also when you dream at night, it's releasing trace amounts of DMT. Dimethyltryptamine is a very basic molecule. It's broken down really quick, but um, it is uh, a lot of people like you're probably hearing now, like a lot of people are actually synthesizing just the DMT and then they smoke it. And you have these, you hear these crazy stories of uh, crazy psychedelic visions and all kinds of things, auditory hallucination, right. you, you name it, it is out there. It's wild. Um, I'm not a big fan of the DMT because it's synthesized like the ketamine. So I'm not big fans of those. Although I do believe that there's probably a time and a place for those. Uh, the ayahuasca is different because it's, uh, it comes from the vine. Um, I forget the Latin name for the vine, like banisteriopsis or something like that. But at any rate, it comes from a vine and that has the, the diamethyltryptamine in it. And then they mix it with some sort of a monoamine oxidase inhibitor, like a daitoro flower, some kind of a leaf, different villages, different tribes, different people make the concoction a little bit different. So depending on where you go drink the medicine, it's going to be a little bit different with everybody. And so what that, cause like, if you hear people smoking DMT, it lasts for like five, 10 minutes, whereas an ayahuasca journey can last, you know, up to six hours. And it's because the MOAI, which allows you to drink it. And then it allows it to stay in your gut long enough for you to process it and actually go through the experience. And for me, for instance, uh, a, like my behavior changed instantly. I mean, the big thing I could tell you is I wouldn't call myself an alcoholic, but I was definitely a binge drinker. And so like, I didn't drink every day. I wasn't the type of guy to go and have a glass of scotch to, or a glass of wine to take the edge off. But I was definitely the guy that if I was going out with friends to drink, it was, uh, it was too much, you know? And so instantaneously all that went away. Um, metacognition went through the roof, just my thinking about my thinking. Um, it, and ultimately, if you go sit with the people down in the jungle, what they say, the only reason why it's for, they always say, don't get caught up in the visions you see, because you will see crazy visions. Um, and I would like to tell one story. I know we're low on time to, uh, sure. based on the visions. But at any rate, what they say it's for is it's to help you change your behavior. Because if you think about sickness, disease, most of the time, even trauma, all these things that happen to us that degrade, degenerate and break down our body is all based off of our behaviors most of the time or based off the behaviors of the people while they were our caretakers. And so most of your illness and most of your wellness can be brought about by your behavior. And so this is what this medicine, the big thing that this medicine does is it changes your behavior. But real quick, I want to share with you and I could go on and on about the experiences I've had in the medicine. But just to give you an idea, me and my wife is the one that brought me to the plant medicines. And uh, she took me to this ceremony when we were dating. And we went to the ceremony and uh, we were sitting with a guy who was trained with the Wachul people. And uh, he was mainly like a peyote guy, but he also did uh, ayahuasca. So we went and we sat with this guy. And it was funny because the whole time I'm trying to t convince my wife, oh, we don't need to do this. Let's not do it. And the whole time she's like, we're going to do this. And when we were in there, I had one of the most amazing experiences and she had one of the hardest experiences. But the medicine man came over to her and sang her a song that I now know was written by a man who I got to later meet down in Peru named Archer Matura, sang this song to her called Saranita Bobansana. And as soon as he started singing the song to her, she immediately calmed down and, uh, and then went into this great place. And when he was done singing the song, she crawled over to me and she said, that's the song of our daughters. And I looked at her because we were just dating at the time, not even thinking marriage. And she was obviously not in her right state of mind, but she came and told me that. And I looked at her like, what the heck are you talking about? So, um, it was right after that we accidentally got pregnant, and, but we miscarried the baby after eight weeks. And, um, and so then we knew we, okay. It's, so it, she has a genetic condition called the MTFHR. I don't know if you ever heard of that. No, it's okay. Well, she had all these things going on where she had been told her whole life, you're infertile. You can't ever have babies. And then, so when we conceived and had the miscarriage, we knew, wait, you can have babies, uh, 
there's just something going on. We got to figure this out. And so we started the whole journey of nutrition, all these different things, researching, learning, and we learned a lot of awesome information that helped us also in our uh, infertility journey. But then what happened is after three years of trying, she said, hey, uh, she made the, the ayahuasca connection. And so and by this time we were married. And so we went to go sit with this medicine man with intentions of we thought that that is what allowed us to have children. And right after, and this guy was uh, classically trained by a man named Carlos Castaneda. I don't know if you ever heard him go look him up. He wrote a lot of controversial books. But at any rate, um, uh, he, the medicine man at the end, he came to me and they sing these songs called Ikiroses. And they're supposed to be medicine songs, healing songs. They're songs they're channeled through. And, but they're saying in Spanish and Portuguese, of which I don't speak. And, uh, but I know enough to know this guy's singing a song about me having a daughter. Like he's singing a song over me. And uh, in the middle of one of these ceremonies, at the end of the ceremony, we're sitting around this campfire and I ask him, I say, hey, I noticed you were singing a song about me having daughters. Uh, what's that all about? Like me and my wife can't have kids. And he looks me dead in the eye and he says, oh, no, you're going to have a daughter. And I and I and then my uh, cynic inside came out and I said, oh, no, I'm not going to have a daughter because I always knew if I did have kids, it would be a son because I always wanted a son, you know. And uh, he's like, no, nope, no, nope, you're going to have a daughter. So then the. Uh, the next time we went and we sat in a ceremony with this guy, we're sitting there and he starts in with the ichorosis and I start having probably one of the hardest times I've ever had in my life. Every negative emotion you can think of started coursing through my body and it got to the point to where I was on my back and I couldn't even breathe because of the, the depression, all these feelings of anxiety, grief, despair, shame, you know, any negative thing you can think of, I was experiencing it all at once and it was too much for me to bear. And uh, later, I thought I said it in my head, but later on, the guy next to me said, I said it out loud, but I said, uh, I said, uh, I, I think all the people that in the jungle, they called the ayahuasca, the grandmother. And I said, grandmother, have mercy on me. And literally it's the moment I said that everything lifted and I could breathe again. And I sat up and then I just started experiencing feelings of love, joy, all the opposite of what I just felt on my back on the ground, barely able to breathe. Now I can experience these deep breaths and I can experienced the warm embrace of love. And I was thinking of everybody that I loved that I needed to go tell I loved and everything. And right as I was uh, thinking all this and experiencing this, the medicine man's wife starts singing a song, Saranita Bogansana. And she starts singing, Saranita de los Rios, danza, danza, con el and She's singing the song. And, as, and I'm watching her. And, as, and I then I remembered, hey, that was the song that calmed my wife down like five years ago, whenever it was. And, and I was like, and that's such a beautiful song. I've never heard it. I wonder what the song is. What's it singing about? And right as she's singing that song, I see this little tiny blue orb come floating in the room. And it's floating in and it lands right on top of my yoga mat. And I'm like, what is that? And I lean forward to look at this thing. And I notice it's a little embryo and it's growing and growing and growing. And I'm like watching it. And then it turns into a baby. I can see this is a baby. And then it grows and grows and grows. And then it grows into a, tod a toddler and then an infant. And then I realized this is my daughter sitting in front of me. And then she grew into a teenager. Then she grew into a woman. And then I heard echoes in the background. And I said, and I knew those are my grandchildren echoing in the background. And then she kept growing and she grew into an old lady, an old woman that was all hunched over and just looked very old and had a broom. And she went around the room. She started dusting out the whole room. And then she dusted me off. And I felt like all this dust and junk and stuff just coming off of me. And then, and then right after that, like she handed me herself a cup of ayahuasca and I went to grab the cup of ayahuasca to drink it and then give her a hug and she disappeared. And as soon as the ceremony was over, you have to go into these ceremonies in a fasted state. And uh, a lot of people don't let you even eat afterwards, but this guy, this particular guy, he has like a bowl of like vegetarian soup sitting there after for after ceremony so i was the first one back there getting my bowl of soup and all i heard was his voice in the background and he said did you see how beautiful your daughter was and i literally dropped my bowl of soup because i was like you saw that and he said not only did i see that i called her in the room <laughs> and then uh and then it was so then the very next day after that me and my wife had to go catch a flight to mexico city because one of my really close friends uh who's actually a trauma surgeon here in town he was getting married and when we caught the flight out, uh, well, basically it was in that trip to Mexico where we conceived our daughter right after that. <laughs> wow. So, and as a result, I, her, her middle name. So I named her first name after my grandmother, who was an amazing 
woman uh, who just had this incredible life of like escaping a revolutionary country and everything, and then coming here to America. And I just always had this huge respect for my grandmother, Rubina. So I named my daughter Ruby after my grandmother. And then I named her middle name Aya after the grandmother. And so that's, and that's how she came about. It's pretty amazing. But because of my experiences like that, that I've had with the medicine, that's just one of many. I just know for a fact that there's something beyond what you can knock on and it makes noise that you can really explain about it. And I know that they're trying to scientifically research ayahuasca now, but I really don't feel like that's going to produce much because when you go down and you work with the people down in the jungle, it's so much different how they look at it than how we look at it up here, you know? So, yeah, I mean, it's pretty amazing. And, you know, I think we probably scared the bejesus out of half the people listening who are still (laughs) remaining after our long explanation (laughs) of of the uh, proprioceptive and nociceptive systems. But, you know, we could do this for days, literally, and we do when we're in person. We talk about this a ton. Um, I want to thank you for being here today, man. Thank and, you, uh, brother. Thank you. I anybody in the DFW region is looking to to really not just get great chiropractic care, but you really look after health and wellness. You're not the, to be crystal clear. He's not a guy you're going to come into his office, going to sell you a bunch of vitamins or try to give you the humdinger <laughs> whack a mole. We always yeah. joke about some of the names that some yes. chiropractors give to their, you know, unique yes. mechanism. Come to yeah. here and we're going to give you the humdinger, you know, <laughs> and you're talking about a guy who's going to treat you appropriately, properly. Um, you're going to feel better. And, uh, Again, he's the kind of person that if you have a question, he always loves answering them. He's happy when you reach out to him and ask questions about ayahuasca or Cambo. And if anybody does want to get a hold of you, what's the best way to reach you? So the best way to reach me is um, you can go actually to my uh, social media platforms, Dr. David Bynum on Instagram. Uh, and that's B-Y-N-U-M for anybody yes, out there who's curious. That is correct. And, um, and that's probably the best way to reach out to me right now is just hit me up on social media. Right on. No, I, I just want to say thank you so much. I need to get in, man. I'm just, I, I get this. No, I'm kidding. I do need, I do to, need to take care of you though, brother. It's, what? You, you take care of a lot of people. You got a lot on your shoulders, so you definitely need it more than anyone probably. Well, you know what? Um, I, you know, I've been on my health and wellness journey the last 12 months or so, really feeling much better, um, being much more intentional about my health. And yes. for me, there's no uh, either or eating the right way. There's working out the right way. There's chiropractic, there's acupuncture, there's massage therapy. There's, you know, what, what you're taking in trace elements, everything comes together in a, a broad way. Just hoping that I don't get hit by a truck at some point. But <laughs> hey, you, have, you have so much vitality now too, since I've, since I first met you just right. like, you know, since doing the jujitsu, all the stuff, it's like, I could, and it's not like I could see, oh, your skin looks better. It's just your energy is better. You know what I mean? My so, chi is flowing, baby. She is flowing, man. The sea of my chi. She is flowing. <laughs> uh, but I want to say thank you from the bottom of my heart for being here today. And uh, just looking forward to learning a lot more from you over time, my friend. It's an honor. I appreciate you, Doc. Thank you so much for everything. <laughs>